we'll uh, have another have another panel session. But um, just before we do, um, I think we have our final poll of the day to run, John. Is that right? Yes, indeed. And I'm just setting it up now. Okay. Thank you. So look in your uh, look look in under the polling tab there. Uh, question on reference architecture. Which of the following is true? Uh, a, B, C, or D, or all of the above, or none of the above. Um, reference architectures are, uh, it, it, it's interesting, I would, I would say in, inside the open group over the last uh, decade, pretty much, um, it, there's been more and more uh, interest and more and more um, of our forums have been interested in, in developing reference architectures, because as I've said, uh, several times, it seems to be that the that one of the beauties of uh, of TOGAF is that it's um, it's applicable across all industries, all technologies, all types of organisations. But obviously, a logical next step is that that individual um, industries want to look at the specific uh, specific environments that they operate in, or any additional or, or uh, uh, requirements or legislation uh, and dive into uh, a, a kind of a next level of detail on architecture and that's where the reference architectures can can be so useful and we've we've seen those in in our work with the uh, with uh in federal aviation and we've seen it with the uh, open process automation forum and uh, military sensors and and uh, most recently with with the um, open subsurface data universe um, work, there, there's uh, and IT for IT, of course, is uh, which we'll hear a lot more about tomorrow. Um, it's a, a reference architecture uh, for running the business of IT so far, but the uh, the next version is is very much focused on the digital product and uh, digital product management included in there. So, reference architectures we've seen as very key. So I'll be very interested in how this poll goes. So. Um, while that is ongoing, um, welcome back to uh, to Palab and Hani. Thank you for your thoughts earlier, and uh, and we have fun. And welcome back also to Sonia, um, who uh, I can't quite see Sonia, but I'm sure you're there. I know you're. I know you're there. Uh, and now I can see you. Great. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's kick off. If you have questions, folks, as a reminder, please put them in the Q and A. Um, uh, the Q and A section uh, uh, in the uh, in the Webex platform. So, the first one um, to come in was maybe I'll I'll aim this at you, Honey, if uh, if I may, at least to start off. Um, the sustainability, uh, the, the the SDGs that you that you spoke about in, and you listed, do the numbers represent a prioritization? Uh, I know you mentioned that they're kind of interconnected in many ways, but do the numbers represent a prioritization of any kind or how did how did the numbers come about? Actually, uh, it's a very simple answer. Not at all. Right. Actually, uh, actually, uh, the guys who designed the SDG uh, logo, they have made it in a circle. Because two things there is no order and everything is interrelated so the quick question is no every everything is important uh, providing that it 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 matches with the country priorities and the country context right okay good, good to know that good to know the background there thank you um and a a, uh, <laughs> a specific on one of those um uh one of the challenges how do how do you deal with challenge number five how do you overcome challenge number five? Um, I don't know if there can be a, re a reminder of challenge number five, but. Uh... So, Steve, let me take this. Uh, yeah, please do. Yeah, because uh, the challenge number five, if I'm not mistaken, was uh, the, you know, the countries with limited resources. Typically, they have multiple initiatives yeah. which are driven more by external push and it does not sustain so yes it's a good good challenge you know for us to look at because the question is how do you deal with that so one one thing that we're looking at if you see one of the slides that honey presented at the lower end it is the attitudes and capabilities so one way we look to address that is to is to kind of address the capability gaps that exist in these countries 
uh, through the, uh, you know, uh, making the body of knowledge accessible to these countries and also uh, coming up with, for instance, a, uh, a big capability framework and a plan which kind of gets augmented by training at different levels. So there are many ways to do this. Uh, but the intent of what we're trying to address here is that the, uh, you know, the uh, for for digital government initiatives to sustain beyond after the external consultants have left, it's important that the internal staff of the governments are competent enough to continue this and take it forward. As Honey was saying in one of the examples that even though the digital services are available, sometimes citizens don't use it for various reasons, which could be because of the capability, which also could be because of the social and cultural barriers, which in fact is the another other, another factor we are, which we are trying to address. Right. Okay, that's that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this one is for for Juan. Um, Juan, you you mentioned um, moving from interoperability to integration. Um, could you explain why it's desirable to do that? Okay, I think I mentioned that when I'm talking about digital services. So uh, when we have an interoperability platform that was established, it has more than 10 years, and with uh, 250 services, web services that are published, and almost 100 organizations connected to the platform. But when we start to digitalize our digital service, we want to focus on the users because most of the digital service or the services that we, we want to digitalize were designed by the public agency organization thinking in the needs and not in the user or citizen needs. So mm -hmm. we want to integrate these digital services and not only the exchange of information when the public organization needs, so we have to, to have a view of the whole of the government and, and think if it's necessary to have two digital services in different public agencies or to integrate in one digital service, service with focus on the citizen. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next question. Um, uh, I'm going to combine two questions here, I guess. Um, one is one is specifically about uh, let's see here where do we go um if you don't have the opportunity to work as an enterprise architect specifically in e-government um how would you suggest i could still be part of the project coupled with a more general question which is um how do i become part of the project uh, and well, sorry, the project being um, the work group, the government enterprise architecture work group. It's the context. So, anyone want to take that? Either maybe Palab or yeah. So uh, I don't know if I've. I hope I've understood the sec the question. If we don't have the opportunity to work as an EA, yeah. So I'm assuming that even if you don't have the opportunity to work as an EA, uh, you have some knowledge of EA as a discipline and. Uh, obviously, it is always helpful if you have experience in the government domain. Uh, I know that there are a lot of people here who may come from other industry. Uh, one way to get involved in the project, one way, of course, is, which is the more natural way, is that the, the organization that you work for would become a member of the open group. That's, of course, the more natural way of logical way of doing it. The other way is that we will make all our work products, uh, you know, work deliverables or work products that come out of the work group available uh, in draft format. Uh, and they, are, they are going to be made available. So you could even act as a reviewer and kind of contribute to it in an individual manner, so to speak. I'm assuming that you want to contribute in an individual manner here. Uh, so that's possible. So these are the two ways to, uh, you know, kind of get involved in the, uh, in the work group, so to speak. Great, thank you, Pallad. Um, This one, several of you may have a a, a view on, but um, I'll I'll start with you, Sonia. I think. Um, what's the difference between a reference architecture and a baseline architecture? I think the main difference, like the baseline architecture, is that your 
to point of start, you know, you need you start defining what you have in your organization. And then depending on the approach, you may decide to either make your own architecture, I mean not using a reference architecture, or may choose to use one to, for example, provide more facilities about integration, interoperability, and reuse of the assets. So the difference is that the baseline architecture is your your current state. And the reference architecture is what you use if you want it to be common into a target state. However, they can be combined as one. So, for example, there are cases in which you already have your architecture, even though it's not described. And this is very common, for example, when you're going to implement an, 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 a system that is already built, you need to adapt with the reference architecture that is already there. So it depends on how the approach is. But I think the main difference is that usually the reference architecture, like I explained our panel presenters today, is to, to favor reuse and best practices and to avoid like starting from zero. So we reuse that. And depending on the sector that you are, we have different reference architecture. There are some of them are for finance, for government, for telcos. So some of them are general. Some models are more specific. For example, if you go back to the talk of enterprise continuum, you may go all the way from the very general foundational architecture, for example, the talk of standard, all the way to a very specific architecture, which is, by the way, one of the questions in the poll. You know, what's the value of a reference architecture if at the end you need to deliver value based on your own architecture? So this is the difference between the two of them. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. A anything to add to that? Uh, any of the other panelists in a in a government context, or I think it's a good good explanation, Sonia. Yes, I totally agree with Sonia. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, um, so I think maybe uh, maybe I can come to you on this one, Hani, um, uh, because I think you mentioned it in uh, in your words, and it's around. Um, let me see here. Yes, has there been any interest in countries in regionalizing their digital services? Um, Palab, I know that you put a, an answer in the Q and A, a written answer in there um in saying yes there is and and specifically there's a follow-up question from the same person um you know has there been interest by countries in africa um so perhaps you could speak to to the more general and then and then uh, african countries perhaps maybe uh maybe let me uh, let me uh, uh contribute to this yeah uh there has been some uh, a number of initiatives actually uh, at different levels uh, to kind of try to harmonize uh, and to regionalize some of the digital service related activities, particularly on the regulatory front. I mean, we we have seen, for example, in Africa, uh, a number of sub regions, whether in West Africa, East Africa, South Africa, there has been some uh, efforts uh, indeed to kind of harmonize some of the regulatory frameworks, um, you know, try to come up with model laws, um, try to come up with some electronic acts, regional electronic acts. However, um, you know, the, the you know, even Smart Africa, I think that have been also trying to come up with some um, regional initiatives around digital identity, for example. Um, however, there are a number of, of kind of challenges um, when it comes to the adoption of countries, you know, mm -hmm. some, some of the regional, you know, frameworks that has been only one country kind of adopting it. So um, it's not an easy thing, uh, though, as I mentioned in my brief uh, intro, um, there is a lot of good reasons why you should adopt regional approaches. However, uh, practically speaking, there are a lot of challenges as well. You know, many in many countries, even there are some political conflicts and uh, if not uh, almost uh, like uh, uh, armed the conflict between countries, neighboring countries. Uh, so it's, it's extremely difficult, but particularly that countries are extremely uh, cautious and uh, about their uh, sovereignty, data sovereignty particularly. So in order to break those types of country barriers uh, and to regionalize, there is a more and more, uh, I would say, awareness from the development partners. You know, if you talk out to the World Bank, to ITU, to the EU, the European Commission, uh, I think everyone is realizing that uh, we need to work um, through regional initiatives. And actually we are as ITU and with others involved already in a regional initiative around digital government in East Africa. 
um, to what extent you can really have shared infrastructure uh, among uh, different countries um, it's not uh, it's not necessarily easy to do however you can still do some um, kind of um, uh, develop some regional frameworks that country can uh, kind of adopt and customize instead of trying to reinvent the wheel or try to, to develop something from scratch so i think if you think of uh, regionalizing there are different levels of you know how, how can you do things you can just develop a framework at a regional level you can try to implement it at a regional level you can try to have data hosting at a regional level so there are different levels and there is a very strong also reason why we do that for this concept of single digital market really to expand the, the digital market to reach economies of scale because as i mentioned this is another big problem in those countries so while there is a lot of good reasons why you would you would want to go regional to kind of uh, you know mutualize investments and reduce the investment increase the impact and return on your investments there are a lot of hurdles actually to make it really happen on reality right so, yeah Yes, no, and as a, a, a comment came in on the chat, that obviously Africa is a is a vast region, as we as we know, and uh, you talked about the you know approaching um, um, approaching it on a regional basis, maybe you know East Africa, West Africa, South Africa, but but even that can be can be challenging, and we see that in we see that with standards in general. You know, there are there are national standards and international standards and and frameworks that uh, get get picked up um, in, in, uh, to different degrees, um, but there's a, it's, it's very difficult to, uh, to share things as important as, uh, as your digital services or even your infrastructure when uh, maybe all is uh, either not well between, uh, between re uh, nations in the, uh, in the region or, uh, or there are other factors, um, just logistics and, uh, and, and financial and, you know, economic factors. It's, uh, it's, it's a challenge, but, um, uh, but the, the positives are there, as you say. So, um, next one, um, uh, could you say a little more about the, the roadmap or the, what you see as the low hanging fruit, uh, in the areas that the working group will tackle? Um, okay, let me take this. So what we have done is, as I have told you, we have the work group has had a few meetings um, uh, in the past three months. And uh, as a team, uh, we have identified three, four priority areas and somewhere alluded to already by Hani. So we have three subgroups at, as of now, you know, which kind of represent the areas that members want to take on in terms of the immediate priority. One is uh, capacity building and competency, and which comes back to the question which I answered earlier, how do you deal with ensuring that the digital government architecture is a sustained uh, initiative? So uh, the, the member, the work group members felt that capacity building and the competency framework is important. So that's one area that we have identified as a quote, low hanging fruit, so to speak. Uh, second is to create a guide for digital government strategy. Uh, as uh, Hani did mention that many of the countries already have a strategy guide in strategy in place, so to speak. But the problem happens in execution of that strategy. So our focus is getting to a point where, uh, you know, you just kind of assume that the country has access to a strategy based on whatever internal capabilities they have. But how do you execute that strategy? So we are getting to a, getting to having another subgroup which focuses on implementing the strategy and what guidance countries need. So that's the second priority area, and that will touch many sub areas within that. And the third one is which we have identified is a collection of case studies. So, for instance, currently we have within that subgroup of case studies, we have one case study coming up from the Czech Republic. Another one is from Spain and the third one is from Canada. OK, you can see that we Obviously, you know, we, we obviously there are going to be case studies from other countries. For instance, India can be included there. Uh, we have Bangladesh, which has also been one of the countries which has adopted digital government architecture. So there are many countries. We have Bhutan also, you know, yes. we are interacting with. Yeah, so absolutely. So we think that these are the three key areas that we are trying to tackle. Uh, and uh, in the slide that Hani presented, you saw the 10 factors. There are other factors which are equally important. So one area which I personally, because I have worked in this domain, which I personally feel is very important is to help countries in their procurement and vendor management. 
because this becomes a major issue for e-government right. or digital government, uh, you know, um, initiatives, so to speak. So it would be good for us to have, for instance, another parallel subgroup to look at procurement and provide some kind of a, if I may use the word like a model RFP, like a template RFP that can be taken up because these countries need a lot of guidance and they are completely dependent on external resources to make this happen. So I think, you know, with that, I, I've given you a summary of what we are working on. And as I said, the opportunities are huge. They are limitless. So uh, we have just touched on some of the, the surface areas and we really would like to dig deeper and help the countries that we are trying to target. Absolutely. And, and to do that, it's good to have more people involved and uh, doing, doing some of the uh, doing some of the work. Thank you. Um, question for Juan. Um, you mentioned uh, an open data initiative. Now, data is obviously uh, if, uh, of on every, you know, very important nowadays, uh, new oil or new gold, however you want to, uh, to describe it. Could you say a little more about that open data initiative in Uruguay, please? Yes, of course. Um, we have a, a special group or in, here in, in AGESIC that works with open data. We have an open data strategy that we build with the, and, um, and we have the, the catalog with open data. We have some main principles that give for the organizations and, and to the develop of the of the different systems with data open by default and uh, all other principles related to data protection. So, and uh, we are working on with organizations to to develop different uh, observatories of, of the of, for the citizens to publish the data. We have a legal framework that. Uh, mandatory have to uh, the organization have to promote and, and publish their budget in the, the in the website the structures and some kind of, of measurement and accomplishment of the objectives they have to, to achieve so uh, i'm not the, the, the expert of, of this topic but uh, we, we have a, a lot of years of experience of working with open data Thank you, thank you. And I think um, at this point, Sonia, do you do you want to uh, look at the last poll um, result? Would that be okay? I think. Let easy. me see. I have the results in here. Just let me put them bigger so I can look at them better. So yes, actually, interesting results. From the poll, first, the first question was reference architecture are important to accelerate and support business transformation. We have 13% of the people saying that it is important. Then reference architecture are one of the key components while delivering your architectural landscape, 13%. The tower standard will be improved if more reference architectures are included. We have a 7% people saying that. And the value of reference architectures is relative since at the end, organizations need to deliver their specific architecture. Uh, sorry, that's one is the one that has 7%. Actually, the need to have reference architecture in TOGAF standard is 10%. And the last one, all of the above, so 18% of the people believe that there is value in reference architecture. So you, we can see there's a, a trend of people saying that actually there's value in reference architecture. And even though some organizations prefer to have their own uh, architecture, specific organization or architecture, still having a reference more general one is, is valuable. And also, again, similar to the other polls that we saw in the previous panel, 60% uh, of the people didn't respond. So that gives us again an idea that we need to do more in this space. So having this kind of testimonials, like for example, the AGESIC and the EA government one are good ones. Actually important to mention that we have several uh, reference architecture works in the open group. We have the commercial aviation, which is a working group, inter architecture forum, the healthcare forum, also working on reference architecture. We have uh, very interesting publications into the architecture and RKMA forums about the buy-in reference models in the financial industry. And we have also a, a webinar and a case study that Ajessic has shared in the past with us about their work. So it's interesting to follow up now that they are going more into the digital space. So there are a lot of information, very valuable information that you can 
find in the open group library uh, that will help you understand more the value of restaurant architecture. Of course, we identify with this that we need to do more. And actually, there are a couple of active groups now and deliverables that are in progress into the architecture forum that are around business architecture and business models for the digital uh, enterprise as well. So uh, stay tuned and, and follow up also our library because you will understand valuable information and find valuable information about this in the Open Group Library as well. Well said. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you. And uh, we will leave it there for the panel. We're right on time. Thank you for uh, for enabling that or facilitating that. And uh, so a uh, big thank you to, to Juan and Palab and Hani and Sonia. So thank you, uh, thank thank you, you. very much. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Thank Bye. You. Bye. So Bye. Uh, that's uh, that. That's about it for today. Just a few a few closing points. Thank you all for your um, attention and participation and the great questions. Uh, thank you to all of our all of our speakers. Um, it's uh, as I said at the beginning. It's it's always good for us to uh, to to hear through the questions and 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 the chat and and any other ways that you might uh, be able to get in touch with us. Um, what what's on your mind as far as the the TOGAF standard is concerned, and some of our other standards that that play to it. Um, and on that point, um, a, a plug for tomorrow's event. Hopefully, um, some of you will will be able to join us um, on that tomorrow. We've got a, a digital professionals um, day tomorrow, so we'll be looking at some of the standards that are that, that are key. Um, in enabling and facilitating that the, the tools that you might use in your digital transformation journeys in uh, inside your organization. So we're looking at uh, new operating models, digital product management, um, emerging roles in a digital operating model, um, product centric technology operating models. There's some of the some of the themes for the presentations tomorrow and uh, and some really good uh, case studies, a, a lot of a lot of fun actually it will be um turning uh one of our forums the it for it forum has been working on a on a novel to set uh basically uh make it make it uh, a very approachable way of of describing um a case study in a fictional organization of uh, their digital transformation journey and using some of the open group standards that will be uh, nice to hear from that tomorrow so hopefully you can you can join us for that if you haven't registered it's not too late um a reminder because we do get uh, the question regularly the uh the presentations um will be available um usually uh the wednesday after the event week so uh, a week tomorrow they will be available um with uh with recordings uh up when they are post-production and we'll make those available to you all if you are registered attendee of the event you will get an email telling you when they are available so you'll be able to look at those in your in your own time and we'll obviously uh make sure that the the video that um uh that ben was running earlier will uh Will be able to be included in that as well as the one that, that Juan has. So um, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Um, Steve, uh, can, can I um, just interject for one moment? I would just want to oh. make sure that people understand that the um, proceedings will be available, but sometimes post production takes a bit longer. So yeah. we can't guarantee that that will be available by next that's Wednesday, a, but it will be available. <laughs> that's a, a good clarification, Maggie. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so. Okay. So the, yes, the materials you'll you'll uh, you will get uh, next Wednesday, and the post production will be as soon as uh, as soon as we can get it done. But uh, it'll give you the chance to um, to uh, either look at it again or look at the parts that that you were unable to be part of, and you'll you'll get those for all three days. But uh, but do join us live tomorrow, um, and uh, if you possibly can, and uh, hope that you found today valuable. We'll leave the. Uh, meeting open and the chat channel going um, for anyone who wants to uh, say hello to anyone else that's uh, that may be attending or uh, give us any feedback. Um, it's been a been a pleasure having you all here today and um, take care. Enjoy the rest of your days or nights um, as appropriate and uh, see as many of you as we can tomorrow. Thank you for, for your participation. Bye bye. Thank you, Steve. Um...
We're just going to run the open group information video now uh, for about five minutes um, whilst people are finishing their chats uh, and then we'll be closing down the session for today. So thank you all for attending.